Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to be starting off talking about a database that wasn't, wasn't mentioned right now. And the reason for that is really it started off as a very customized, very purpose-driven database. And it's only been over the last couple of years, last year in particular, they were trying to open that database up for a much broader community. So the thing is still, it's an arthropod-focused database, and I think it probably will stay like that. Um, some of the reasons might come out during my, uh, during my talk. So the database I'm talking about is now called Arthropod Easy Capture, short AEC. And you have to bear with me because there might be another term slipping out, out of my mouth every once in a while, which is PBI database, because it only really changed its name last year when we tried to broaden it up. So it started off as uh, the PBI database. Also, um, this lecture really is sort of, you know, obviously I'm g giving it, but um, there are two people that were really, really important in development of this database. Um, and one is my former postdoc mentor at the American Museum, Ronald Tichu. And then um, the current project manager of that ADBC project I talked about yesterday, Katya Seltman. So she's been developing and driving that database in, in recent years. Okay, I just want to briefly go over the beginnings. Where does the database come from? How does it work? Just a quick overview. We might have a chance on Thursday afternoon, and it's permitting internet connection, um, to actually play with the database for those of you working on arthropods in particular and might be interested in looking into workflows and see how that database works. Um, so we have what we call a sandbox version of the database that everyone can get access to really easily and just run through um, specimen data entry to see if it feels comfortable and like something that people want, might want to consider. Um, I briefly talk about data output dissemination and then I just really gloss over um, the two other topics. Okay, so where does the database come from? Um, it really started in 2003, 2004 as part of the US National Science Foundation funded Planned Bug Planetary Biodiversity Inventory Project. Um, the focus of this project is on global revolutionary taxonomy, um, studies of two subfamilies of Meridae um, with PIs, Tobichu, uh, Jerry Cassis, and we we're really only two, two and a half years ago that project was sort of wrapped up, even though we're still working on certain revisions. Um, so what happened throughout this project is we looked at about a quarter of a million specimens, and most of them were looked at under you know, those revisionary aspects to actually make sure that, um, well, obviously we described a lot of new species, but then also all the information that was entered during this project, it was really is that, you know, following up on what I said yesterday, that really high quality data where we're very, very confident about species identifications. So not a huge amount of data compared to some other projects out there um, that were entered during this project, but you know, superb information. Okay, so um, what were the challenges? Really, um, the challenges at that point were that we knew we were going to be dealing with about 100 to several thousand specimens for each of the individual revisionary projects. So there were about 10, 10, 12 of us actually doing the taxonomic work, and we knew all of us had to cope with a lot of specimens. Then we have external information, to put it that way, so we have you know, genitalic dissections that we have to make sure we keep connected with the specimens. We have images, images of the males and females, which means there's lots of information to keep track of. So in 2003, we said, well, there's no way other than using a specimen database of some sort to actually make sure that we're not losing any of the information. Okay, and then there was one other thing, and this really had a huge impact on what we decided to do essentially during this project was that for taxonomic work on Meridae, the plant host associations are really, really, really important because a lot of these insects are very, very specific to only maybe one species of plant out there, maybe in certain cases species within a given genus of plants, and so on and so forth. And one of the goals of this project was really to look into these species, insect, plant species associations to make sure we can track them and map them as correctly as um, as possible. And this, in a way, as early as 2003, um, made us look critically at the available database options that were out there at some point, at that point. 
And we decided for what we're trying to do, which is in you know, one swoop really capture insect specimen information and keep that host plant um, association really tightly connected, none of these databases at that point really actually worked that well. So, and this in part is, or in great part, is why we decided to um, go with our own customized and develop from scratch database, which is in many ways not a smart thing to do, obviously, because it's a lot of effort and work and money that goes into it. So in the end, um, other than the host plan um, thing, the, the um, goals of um, goals of generating this, um, this database was to um, come up with material examined sections for the publications, um, but also allow data download for geographic mapping because this is what we typically do. We incorporate um, distribution maps based on dots, obviously, into our publications. Um, produce also a list of plant host species that you can use in an appendix, for example. Um, but not also more maintenance type things like generate tables for image specimens, measurements, dissections, so we don't really have to you know, keep track of that otherwise really. But then also um, help to disseminate the information. So this goes into the realm of show data and not actual research data, but it's an important aspect of every um, bigger you know, um, NSF funded grant obviously. So we felt we needed to actually show what we're doing and make sure people can actually see the data out there. Okay, so our initial goals did not include um, um, to include a descriptive database into that. So when I say descriptive database, it would be something that's fully customized to not only take care of specimen information, but also something that would allow you to write species descriptions from a database essentially. So we didn't do that, but um, you're going to be seeing that other projects that started using the data but actually ended up doing that. Um, we also didn't really envision that we're going to be mapping specimen um, locality information directly from the database because we're going to be, we were going to be using a data aggregator to actually do that. But in the end, we did develop these tools and there were certain advantages to that. And then also um, species pages, we only thought of doing that through data aggregators and not ourselves. But again, this happened um, as a byproduct of some of the other projects. Okay, so how does the whole thing work? Um, so the database is a, a MySQL database with PHP driven web pages, obviously Darwin core standards. If you want to read up a little bit more information on that database, um, this is the resource to go to, SHU et al. 2010. I will put that on, um, on, on sticks and hand it out to everyone together with a few other resources I have as well. So obviously what we're capturing here, and this is pretty, you know, pretty um, simple scheme, obviously we have all the um, locality collection event information as we call it. You have the specimen data um, that comes with a bunch of um, subcategories. We have the host data and this is a very important thing that we um, put a lot of emphasis on. We need to obviously get the taxonomy in there which means the authority files that Katya talked about. We want to be able to attach images to that whole thing. And then the DNA sequence data is something that we never really actually pursued to the extent that we initially planned on doing. But it, it can be done. Okay, this is what the first page of the, um, of the database looks like. So I think what the people who developed it and have been using it and customized it, why we used it essentially. So I'm one of the users. I used the database and if there's something I don't like, I typically went back to the, the people who helped develop it at the American Museum and I said, oh, could we customize it to this and that? And this is how the improvement of the database over time really happened. Um, so what I really like about it, it's a one-page thing. So you don't really have a lot of um, different windows open at the same time. So typically, when we do data entry, we have two windows open, and I come to that in a second. So it's a very simple design. Um, it's also um, quite well organized, obviously. We have the um, taxonomic information on top, then we have locality information in a section over here the actual collection event information, the collector, the date below it. Then we have a bigger section on specimen information and then down below the host information. So it's all in one thing. Obviously there's more information behind it, which means that 
when you click on certain of these drop down menus or you click on some of these um, these boxes here, it will pop up another window that then disappears once you've entered the information you need to enter. So you really start with um, text and information. Let's say you're databasing from a specimen in front of you that's been databased to or that's been identified to species level. What you would typically do is, let's assume you don't really know what family it is and you just go to genus and find in a drop long drop down menu the right genus. You confirm that and then it will fill in all the higher level um, taxonomic hierarchy by itself. And then it will obviously within that genus narrow down the options to only give you those species that are currently recognized in that genus. So that makes it, you know, makes the, the whole, well, obviously databases are always, they're trying to be restrictive on allowing you to make mistakes. So the more specific you can be on things like that, the better. Um, locality information, same here, find locality is, would give you a page that shows you all the um, localities that have already been entered and obviously customized, narrowed down by country and then primary, secondary subdivisions. Um, the same here for the collection event information. Unfortunately, um, in, um, in insect world, we don't have a beautiful research as uh, the bot botanists have in terms of a collector database. So this is one of the really, well, it was driven by the people who started entering data essentially. And of all the fields we have in the database at the moment, this is probably one of the messiest fields because different um, collectors have become in different iterations. Like sometimes they would use their middle name or they would not use their middle name, so on and so forth. So this is in our case a very, um, a very messy thing to look at. Okay, and then down in the um, specimen information, you can have obviously a whole um, bunch of different, um, different um, items there. One thing that's really important for us too is determination history. So if you see on the, a string of labels that are stuck on that specimen, that this particular specimen was first identified as some, something, then was moved to, you know, the, so someone else came in and re-identified it. Um, and decided it belonged to a different genus and species, for example, all that information can be captured in here and a lot of other details that I hope we will have the chance to look over the database uh, more clearly. And then we have the host information. The host information by now works very similar to the actual text and information of the insect specimen. So also you would type in a genus or species name that fills in the hierarchy, which is us being entomologists, figuring out um, planned higher level systematics has always been a bit of a problem, but this is by now, um, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to use that part of the database as well. Okay, and um, you see there's obviously there's, there's messy things in there as well, and this is, uh, I guess, to a certain degree, um, the way we're doing business, which is you know, really focused on the research aspects. Um, of databasing specimens. It's somewhat unavoidable even though it's, um, it's not very nice. So you can see some people when they, let's say, enter a new species because sometimes from the authority files we've entered, a given species might be missing because it's just been um, fairly recently described, for example. So if you enter a species without the author attached to it, it allows you to do that at the moment. So there are certain flexibilities in these fields that are not very desirable. On the other hand, certain things are probably desirable. In this case, for example, someone was collecting data for um, a species that's called um, a Pumerus acunae, and you see MS stands for manuscript species. So this is a species that's not been described yet. So obviously the assumption is that this name will get um, um, validated at some point and the MS will then be removed. But you know, it's all part of the um, working with a database like this. Okay, the other thing the botanists are doing much better than uh, what we're doing is we do have the core for an authority file for institutions that have entomological collections and it's the so-called ARNET uh, list of insect and spider collections from around the world. 